On February 15, 2013, the scientific community was awaiting the approach of 367943 Duende, an asteroid that had been discovered the year before and which was returning for a close pass by the Earth. Duende was not a large asteroid, measuring about 20 by 40 meters or about 65 by 131 feet, but it was unusual in a different way. Duende was about to pass very, very close to Earth. Of course, Earth is hit by asteroids all the time, and missed by them even more often. But it's much more unusual to have an asteroid that is both already known of and about to come very close to Earth, especially in this size category. Duende was predicted to pass by no closer than 3.2 times the radius of the Earth. And the radius of the Earth is about 6.4 kilometers, or 3.96 miles. So 3.2 times that is about 20.5 kilometers, or 12.7 miles. In astronomy terms, this is absurdly close. GPS satellites orbit Earth at about 20 kilometers, or almost exactly the same as this minimum expected pass. That is very, very close, but it is still a flyby, not an asteroid impact. So imagine the surprise when, on February 15th, 2013, a fireball lit up the sky in Chelyabinsk, Russia. The meteor entered the atmosphere and soon succumbed to the pressure and heat, causing it to explode and produce a dramatic fireball in a phenomenon known as an airburst. Thankfully, being Russia, this was caught on many, many dash cams as well as other cameras in the area, providing many incredible videos of the event. The explosion itself damaged buildings, including causing windows and glass doors to shatter from the shockwave, which was the primary cause of injuries amongst the 1,491 people who sought medical treatment. No one was directly struck by any fragments of the meteor, and thankfully no one was killed, likely because the meteor exploded at a high enough altitude that the atmosphere itself actually absorbed some of the energy. But to add even further to the surprise of this event, this meteor was not Duende. The Chelyabinsk meteor was an entirely separate, previously unknown object that had struck Earth on the same day as Duende's predicted flyby by pure chance. But this is an excellent illustration of why it's so important to be aware of nearby asteroids and why so much work goes into the system set up to identify and study them. The Chelyabinsk meteor, calculated to have been about 20 meters or 65 feet in diameter, had been thankfully small, but it eerily echoed a previous event that many mystery lovers might be familiar with. This event also occurred in Russia, but over a hundred years earlier, on June 30th, 1908. That morning, eyewitnesses near the Tunguska River in Russia reported seeing a blue light move across the sky before it flashed and then lit up in flames. Ten minutes later, a shockwave rolled over them, along with strange loud sounds almost like gunshots. This shockwave, much like the one in Chelyabinsk, damaged buildings and even knocked people down, but the area was remote and not heavily populated at the time. Unfortunately, two people reportedly died due to injuries from this event, and the forest under the point where the airburst was believed to have occurred was destroyed. The images are somewhat famous, showing a stretch of now flattened trees in the midst of a forest, but even more amazingly, the trees at the center of the event were still upright, but burned and missing their branches. The area of destruction was irregular, but approximately 2,100 square kilometers, or about 830 square miles total. For a long time, the Tunguska event was something of a mystery, although many suspected a meteor to have been the cause right from the start. But with the Chelyabinsk event, scientists were able to gather data that they didn't have before, and to even more confidently conclude that not only was a meteor the likely cause of the Tunguska event, but give them the data necessary to run simulations and determine some likely information about the original Tunguska meteor. In this case, the Tunguska meteor was likely between 50 to 60 meters, or 160 to 200 feet, in diameter, much larger than the Chelyabinsk meteor. Although it was also ultimately an airburst, the Tunguska meteor was pushing the limits when it came to reaching dangerous size. Anything much larger or more strongly held together might make it through the atmosphere in a large enough chunk to cause serious damage. And avoiding impacts of this sort is why identifying mid-sized asteroids that might pass by Earth is so crucial. NASA's Near Earth Object, or NEO, observations program is dedicated to this task, finding and cataloging as many near-Earth objects as possible in order to observe them, calculate their properties and their orbits, and assess any potential hazards that they might pose to the Earth. Incredible progress has been made toward this goal since it began in 1998, with more than 19,000 near-Earth objects cataloged as of 2019. But NASA still predicts that 60% of asteroids 140 meters or larger are yet to be discovered, with even more asteroids of a smaller intermediate size, such as the Chelyabinsk meteor, also undiscovered. But what happens when you do discover a potentially dangerous asteroid, but only with a few hours to spare? On July 24, 2019, Gustavo Jacques, Eduardo Pimentel, and Jules Ribeiro, who operate the Southern Observatory for Near-Earth Asteroids Research, or SONIR, in Oliveira, Brazil, 
noticed an unknown object in the night sky. This object had an apparent magnitude of 14.7, and for this to mean anything, I'm going to have to briefly go into how the magnitude system works. At the most basic level, magnitude is a way to compare the brightness of objects in the sky, which is not only useful for categorization, but which tells us a whole lot about the object we're actually looking at. Magnitude is split into two different kinds, absolute and apparent. Absolute is the inherent brightness of the object when viewed from a specific distance, specifically in this case 10 parsecs, and for some objects we actually know what that inherent brightness should be. Think of something like a 60 watt light bulb. If you stand 10 feet away from a 60 watt light bulb, it should be the same brightness as any other 60 watt light bulb that you stand 10 feet from, and this is the case for objects with the same absolute magnitude. In contrast, apparent magnitude is how bright the object appears to us. And although factors like interstellar clouds and the Earth's atmosphere can also affect apparent magnitude, it depends primarily on distance. Using the lamp example, imagine that you're now 50 feet away from this light bulb instead of 10. The lamp will look much dimmer than it would at 10 feet. And that new brightness that you see, which is dimmer, is the apparent magnitude. When you compare the apparent magnitude to the absolute magnitude, then you can do a calculation to find the difference in distance, and in fact, this is a very simple calculation. Alternatively, if you know the distance to the object as well as either one of the magnitudes, you could easily solve for the other one. Reasonable enough, right? Sure. But two things in particular tend to make the magnitude system difficult to actually work with. First is that one might expect that the brighter the object, the larger the magnitude, but this is actually the opposite. Considering zero as the midpoint, the more negative a magnitude, the brighter the object. So the more positive the number, the dimmer the object. The second mind bender is that magnitude is logarithmic, not linear. There's a reason for this, but it does make it very difficult to conceptualize the difference between two magnitudes. For example, a magnitude difference of 1 is a brightness ratio of 2.5, so an object of magnitude 0 is 2.5 times brighter than a magnitude 1. You might naturally expect then that a magnitude 0 object would be 5 times brighter than a magnitude 2, but that isn't the case. The ratio is instead 6.3, since this is a logarithmic increase. So now that we know that, it's helpful to have some frames of reference for the apparent magnitudes of objects seen on Earth. The Sun is about negative 26, the full moon around negative 12. Jupiter, which is typically very bright in the night sky, averages around minus 2. Betelgeuse, the bright red star in Orion's shoulder, ranges from 0 to positive 1.6, depending on how much it's trying to trick us into thinking it might go supernova sometime soon. Polaris, the North Star, is about positive 2, and Neptune, an incredibly faint planet, is around positive 8. So now, with all of that out of the way, you'll have a better idea of the ominous observations that occur over the next few hours of July 24th, 2019. So near, with its observation of a 14.7 magnitude object that hadn't existed before, made two more observations in rapid succession, repeating its findings. However, detections by only one observatory, especially of an object that is so faint, are not enough to be sure of a discovery, and so they needed their findings to be corroborated by another source. About nine hours later, the McDonald Observatory in Austin, Texas confirmed the sighting with three observations of their own, with magnitudes of 14.2 each time. Interestingly, the object appeared to be moving very slowly, with only very minor changes in its coordinates since Sonier's observations. Around 10 minutes later, Fox Telescope North at Haleakala Observatory on the island of Maui in Hawaii made a series of three observations. Each showed an object with a magnitude of 14.1. Ison Castle Grande in the Basilicata region of Italy was the next to observe this object 10 hours later, with four back-to-back -back observations of a magnitude of 11.4 to 11.5. This was a large increase in brightness, although, once again, the object seemed to be moving very, very slowly. At this point, the International Astronomical Union Minor Planet Center, which contains an international database of near-Earth objects, listed this new asteroid, soon to be known as 2019 OK, in their database. Because it hadn't been observed before this, though put an asterisk in that, we'll come back to it, there was no previous data on this object's orbit to rely on for predicting its trajectory. However, some vital information had already been attained. The magnitude changes over time, and the changes in the object's galactic coordinates. The differences in magnitude over a period of time gives us the distance traveled toward us in that time, due to being able to do the calculation based on the change in magnitude, and the change in coordinates gives us a direction and an angle. But with a set of only 13 data points, three observations each from Sonier, McDonald, and Fox, and four from Castle Grande, it's still a very small sample size, and the more data that can be analyzed, the more confident and precise a prediction can be. So a little over two hours later, Kharkiv University in Ukraine began a series of 14 observations made over the next few minutes, getting an average magnitude of about 10.0, 
indicating another large increase in brightness over only a few hours. I should note here that small differences in magnitudes between the different observatories or even at the same observatory is not uncommon depending on the equipment, the conditions, how calibrations are done, data cleaning, etc, etc. So these small variations up and down don't matter all that much, it's more the trend that matters. An hour and a half later, Castle Grande observed a magnitude of 9.0, and then an 8.9 half a minute later. At the same time as the Castle Grande observations, Ison Burakan in Armenia made a series of 24 observations over a minute and a half, averaging a magnitude of 9.3. A minute later, Castle Grande then made another two observations over about 25 seconds, revealing magnitudes of 9.0 and 9.1. And then, just over an hour later, at 1.22 UTC time, just over 24 hours after its first detection by Sonir, 2019 OK passed by the Earth at a distance of 71,354 kilometers, or about 44,337 miles, a little over 3.5 times the distance of GPS satellites near the Earth, and less than twice the distance of high Earth orbit from Earth. To put it in another perspective, this is a little under a fifth of the distance to the Moon. A very near miss, particularly for an asteroid that had been discovered only 24 hours earlier. But work was certainly not done. Although 2019 OK had thankfully passed by, this object was still a mystery, and more observations needed to be done quickly before it disappeared into the depths of space again for some indeterminate amount of time. If its orbit had brought it that close once, the risk this object posed for next time needed to be assessed as soon as possible. About 41 hours after its detection, the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico had 2019 OK in its sights and was able to make a series of observations. Arecibo was a radio telescope that was sadly decommissioned in 2020, and not only could it receive radio, but it could use radar to bounce radio waves off of an object and measure the returning energy. This allows for the study of not just position and distance of the object, but its size and reflectivity, called albedo. Albedo is important to determine because the more reflective an object, the brighter it is, and so an object with a high albedo will appear more bright. The catch is, is that brightness is also used for calculating the size of an object, as the more surface area to reflect light, the brighter it'll appear. This means it's important to understand either the size or the albedo of the object to correctly calculate the other. There are a few additional tricks to it, such as knowing the particular composition of a type of asteroid can give you a general range of albedo, but direct observations are always better than relying on averages. The radio albedo, how reflective the object is when it comes to the radio spectrum, which can be different from visible or other types of light, of 2019 OK was determined, and when combined with the newly calculated absolute magnitude, an estimate for the size of the object was made. 2019 OK is likely 70 to 130 meters in diameter, or about 230 to 426 feet, significantly larger than the Tunguska meteor, even on the conservative end of the estimate. Impact by an asteroid of this size would not be catastrophic for the Earth, but it would certainly be a major event, especially if it entered the atmosphere over somewhere populated. But in addition to the calculations of 2019 OK's size, observations helped pin down the specifics of this object's orbit. And the next closest approach of 2019 OK will be in 2196, at a distance of 4 million kilometers, nowhere near as close as the 71,000 kilometer brush in 2019. But it was discovered that the orbital period of the asteroid was just 2.72 years, which begged the question of where the object was two years earlier. Had it swung wide and we just hadn't seen it? As it turned out, yes, 2019 OK had been much more distant from the Earth on its last approach in 2017. However, we had seen it. Multiple times. February 21, 2017, the actual first detection of the asteroid that would come to be known as 2019 OK was made by the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System called PANSTARS. The telescope system is part of Haleakala Observatory, and PANSTARS is dedicated to primarily searching for near-Earth objects. It does this by photographing the entire night sky on a continual basis, and as the data is collected, it's processed and searched for evidence of new detections. But because of the sheer amount of data, 10 terabytes a night, much of the initial data analysis is done through algorithms. Unfortunately, in the case of 2019 OK, PANSTARS' detection was originally missed due to how faint the object was. The apparent magnitude was only 22.3, as well as that the object appeared to be moving very slowly due to the angle of its orbit. Over the next month, PANSTARS continued to catch the object in photos for a total of six observations, but it still went unrecognized for what it was. Also in 2017, the Dark Energy Camera at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile made an initial detection March 2nd, and then two more on March 23rd and March 24th, with apparent magnitudes of 22.4 to 23.0. These also remained unnoticed, again likely due to the faintness and the apparent lack of speed. 
But it wasn't just that last orbit in 2017 that had been seen but unrecognized for what it was. Nearly a month before the July 25th flyby in 2019, PanStars once again picked up the object on June 28th, this time at a magnitude of 22.9. Five more observations were made that same day, and another four made July 7th, with the brightest detection being 21.2. However, once again, the object was too faint and seemingly moving too slow to be identified as an asteroid. A few weeks later, and just a few days before the flyby, on July 21st, one of the telescopes that make up the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS, also located at Haleakala Observatory, picked up 2019 OK at a magnitude of 17.01. It made another seven observations that day, but just as with PanStars, the object's importance was overlooked. In addition to the faintness and the slow apparent movement of the object, around this time there was also an added complication, the moon. July 16th of 2019, there was a full moon, and 2019 OK just happened to be coming from the same general part of the sky as the full moon had been in. With an apparent magnitude of negative 12, the full moon can drown out other objects around it, not just to human observers, but to instruments as well. Think of it kind of like trying to record a faint sound on a microphone while something loud is playing in the same room. If you know what to listen to, you might be able to hear the faint noise on a playback of the recording, but if you don't, chances are you won't hear it or you won't recognize it for the sound that it was. Even if you ran it through a computer system designed to pull out faint noises, even it might get confused depending on how faint and how muddled the noises are. For telescopes, this is a similar problem when it comes to light, and it's therefore likely that, despite 2019 OK brightening from a magnitude of 21 to a magnitude of 17, the full moon likely played a part in delaying the identification of 2019 OK until the scientists at SONIR noticed it July 24th, 2019. But you might be wondering, reasonably, how could this happen? How could so many observatories, including those specifically designed and intended to notice potentially hazardous asteroids, not just miss, but completely disregard observations? These were vital questions to answer, and 2019 OK was therefore an incredibly important learning experience, as it revealed a flaw in the way that the data was handled. Although there's only so much that can be done about faint objects being ignored, as the data has to be filtered to some extent in order to have any hope of being processed for important information, what could be redesigned is how objects that appear nearly stationary might be assessed. After all, the asteroids that appear to be moving very slowly are exactly the ones you need to be concerned about, because an object that appears not to be moving, but is getting brighter and brighter, is probably coming toward you, which is indeed what was happening in this case. Thankfully, however, 2019 OK was not on the collision course, and instead provided an opportunity to identify these oversights and work on improving the systems, so that these same weaknesses in detection will hopefully not be a problem in the future. But what if, instead of a near miss, 2019 OK had been identified just hours before an impact? What could we have done then? Unfortunately, during the time frame of this discovery, very little could have actually been done. It was just too short of a time, which is why early detection is so incredibly important and there are so many observatories dedicated to looking for these near-Earth objects. With enough early detection, a plan to deal with a potentially dangerous asteroid impact can be devised, particularly for an object the size of 2019 OK. In its case, even if it were headed directly for a city, a simple evacuation might have been enough to avoid a lot of the danger to human life, provided there was enough advanced warning to coordinate such a thing. Think of it like a hurricane. If it's coming and you know it's coming, you can evacuate. But there are other means of protecting the planet from asteroids in the works as well, including the very recent and highly successful double asteroid redirection test called DART in 2022. Launched November 24th, 2021, the satellite reached its target on September 26th, 2022, colliding with the 177 meter asteroid Demorphos and drastically altering its orbit around the asteroid that it circles, Didymos. This was a successful proof of not only concept, but engineering, an incredibly important first step for a long-discussed method of diverting dangerous asteroids. This is an option that is best for us for particularly large asteroids, as exploding them in space runs the risk of smaller but still dangerous asteroids entering the atmosphere, and also requires a lot more energy and power. It's generally considered much more feasible and much more practical to simply divert an asteroid so an impact doesn't happen. But after all of this ominous talk, it is important to state clearly that, as of right now, no asteroids large enough to be a threat to the Earth are both known and on a trajectory that might cause an impact, although a few large asteroids, such as the massive 350-meter asteroid Apophis, are predicted to make close flybys in the near future. And while there is always a risk of an asteroid like 2019 OK or the Chelyabinsk meteor striking Earth without warning, space is really, really big, and the chance of anything actually running into the Earth is ultimately quite small. Besides, with any luck, the Tunguska event has already used up all of our odds for the next few thousand years. Duende, by the way, 
did indeed make an incredibly close pass to the Earth on February 15th, 2013, exactly as predicted, about 16 hours after the Chelyabinsk meteor. It missed Earth by about 27,700 kilometers, or about 17,211 miles, passing closer than the satellites in geostationary high Earth orbit, and in fact came so close that its own orbit was altered by the Earth's gravitational pull. Its next closest pass won't be until February 18th, 2116, when it'll fly by at about 105,000 kilometers from the Earth. The precise calculation of Duende's orbit is a testament to just how good astronomers and other scientists have become at understanding and predicting the motion of these objects, even with so many variables to take into account and even limited observation data. The cooperation of people and organizations around the entire world, all working together to make our planet safer, has produced incredible results. As of 2022, six asteroids have been identified and predicted to impact Earth before they actually did so. They were all harmless, burning up in the atmosphere, but each of them was an incredible testament to how far we've come. And that's it. I hope you all enjoyed. I love space stuff, which is why I have two fancy degrees in it, though not in the area of asteroid detection. So I've done my best with the information here. If somebody has corrections, please let me know. I'd be interested in hearing it. I will, of course, take any opportunity to talk about space if people are interested in listening, so please let me know if you like these sorts of topics. There is some spooky stuff out in space that I would love to cover in the future. Next up, however, is likely the next part of the large urban legends iceberg, or a new mysterious depths, depending on which comes to me and which I can focus on long enough to write a script. But speaking of the iceberg, I can't thank you all enough for the response it, and my other videos too, have gotten recently. As I mentioned in a recent post, I've been dealing with a serious family emergency for the last few weeks, and so reading all of your nice comments and seeing all the views and new subscribers has been incredibly encouraging and uplifting during a time when I really needed it. So this video is dedicated to all of you. Thanks for watching.